Hello and welcome to lecture 48 of my class from Data Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this course, and this lecture is on standardized variables. They are used in regression. We will sometimes have a need to standardize the input and output, the response and predictor variables of our model. So consider a model where y is the response and we have a variety of x, it's a variety of predictor variables. We can standardize each of the variables, the response variables, and each of the predictor variables in the following ways. Um, the most common standardized standardization of these variables is called unit normal scaling. It's where we take the variable, subtract off its mean, divide by its standard deviation. Uh, we've seen these kind of uh, standardization a lot, right? So Z normal scores or, or T scores uh, perform this kind of thing, but now we're doing it with the data. So if we have an array of, of uh, n data points and we have n y values, we can create a mean and then standard deviation of those y values, the responses. And we can do that for each of the predictor variables. So the mean and standard deviation of all the values of every single predictor variable. Um, when we do that, we have now a standardized version of each of the variables, and we can create a model, um, do our regression on those standardized versions, just like we can do on the original data. Another form uh, takes those standardized unit normal scaling uh, standardized variables and simply divides by the square root of n minus 1. Right. This is sometimes called a correlation transformation or unit length scaling. So it, it's just a, a, a simple constant multiplied by each of the um, standardized unit normal scaling versions of those variables. Well, why would we do this? What is the good of it? Part of it has to do with um, kind of making magnitude of each of the variables about the same. And so each of our variables are going, to, are going to be plus or minus one or two or three, right? Once we've standardized in our unit normal scaling. Uh, sometimes we'll have some variables that might have units like uh, 0 0.001 um, magnitudes, and another might have 1,000 or 10,000, right? Depending on the units of the predictor variables. Uh, and the, the big differences in the, the scales of the numbers sometimes lead to numerical instabilities. Recall our OLS uh, matrix formulation method. We, we take all the responses and put it in a vector, um, and, we, and we create a design matrix of all the uh, input variables uh, like this, and then we formulate our equation vector form or a matrix form like this. We end up, <coughs> excuse me, we end up with a, a matrix or a vector of all of the model coefficients, the betas. And then from that, we can solve for the best fit coefficients and predicted values. We have something called the hat matrix. We calculate the residuals. And our covariance matrix gives us the um, uncertainties, the standard errors of our coefficients and their correlations. When we standardize, uh, our variables before we do our regression it leads to some um, nice things about these uh, matrix representations. So the first thing that happens uh, when we do what we call standardized regression modeling is that the intercept term goes away. Right? So there will be no intercept term in the model. Um, it's simply because we've subtracted out the means of everything and when we do that uh, the intercept term, which includes all those means, will disappear. Uh, if we do our regression modeling with these standardized variables, we can then convert back to the original uh, models very, very simply using these equations. This is These equations down here work whether I'm using uh, the unit normal scaling or the unit length scaling. Because if I divided by the square root of n minus 1 on both of these terms, it would turn out the same. Okay. Um, what is this good for? Well, one thing it's good for is that uh, uh, once we've normalized in this uh, um, 
progression transformation approach, then xt times x, the transpose of our design matrix times the design matrix after it's been standardized, is the correlation matrix. Likewise, x transpose times y is uh, the correlation of each of the regressor variables uh, with the response. And so uh, we kind of naturally get out our correlation matrix from this uh, of standardized regression. Let me give you an example of what it would look like if I had two regressor variables, just x1 and x2. Right? Our model, as you see, don't, doesn't have an intercept term in it. It's in the standardized uh, form. And the inverse of xt times x, which is how we get uh, most of our solutions, um, you can see is a function only of the correlation between variables 1 and 2, r1, 2. From that, we can get an R-squared, get our coefficients, beta 1 and beta 2, standard errors of those coefficients, variance matrix, hat matrix, everything uh, you see is going to be now put in terms of the regression um, correlation R1, 2. Uh, very convenient because it shows you the influence of that multicollinearity, that correlation between variables 1 and 2. Right, so uh, we see that r squared is not a function of correlations 1 and 2, other than in the parameters beta 1 and beta 2. The beta 1 and beta 2, uh, you see, have the correlation of 1 with y, or the correlation with 2 with y, and then it subtracts off r12 times r2y, the other term. So if the cross correlation between variables 1 and 2 is 0. That is, I have an orthogonal set of two parameters. Then in this normalized, uh, standardized uh, space, the model coefficient beta 1 is simply the correlation coefficient between variable 1 and y. Likewise, beta 2 is simply r2 time, r2y, the correlation between the second predicted variable and our response. Under, if I have that special case of orthogonal regression where, or excuse me, not orthogonal regression, orthogonal variables x1 and x2, so that r12 is 0. Uh, see that the standard errors, simply the standard deviation of the residuals. Uh, there's no covariance. Covariance uh, goes away, um, etc. So that idea of having no correlation between our two variables uh, has lots of advantages that become clear in this formulation. Well, can we get anything good to happen because of the standardization? Well, there's one case where it might be helpful. Uh, when we standardize, we reduce the correlations between a variable and uh, that variable squared. It's been standardized and uh, between interaction terms and primary terms. Uh, but this doesn't really change the regression at all. And if we're subtracting off a constant and dividing by a constant, are we really changing anything in the regression? Not really, except for the possibility of round off error. We do some of our calculations. If we have some of our terms are really large and other of our terms are really small, we can suffer from rounding errors. And so, I can get less of those rounding errors or numerical instabilities when I do my matrix inversion for the OLS solution. Now, with double precision math that we generally use in all of our calculations, this is almost never a big problem. Nonetheless, uh, I think a lot of software packages end up doing this kind of standardization just to be safe. It's not going to help with the problem of multicollinearity. And if you have multicollinearity, um, subtracting off a constant and dividing by a constant for your variables doesn't change that. We will, however, need to use this standardization uh, a little bit later in the semester to study principle component analysis. And that's a few lectures away, but we're going to show that we need this standardization and performing that special kind of analysis. All right, what have we learned in lecture 48? 
What is variable standardization and why is it used? And our second and last question. In general, will standardization help with problems of multicollinearity? Uh, that's our lecture. In our next lecture, we'll demonstrate some of the principles of the last two lectures in R and Excel. Till then.